Welcome to the Experts in Sport podcast, brought to you by the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences at Loughborough University. Welcome back to another sports performance-based episode. I'm Stuart McCurley-Naylor and I'm joined today by Franco Impelitzeri, who has a really interesting background as a sports coach in clinical science and now as a professor in sport and exercise science and medicine at the University of Technology, Sydney. We'll be talking about athlete training load monitoring in elite sport, some of the limitations or myths and misconceptions in that area, and also how sports science can benefit from some of the learnings in more clinical research that Franco has experienced throughout his career. Hi Franco, welcome to the Experts in Sport podcast. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for the invitation. No worries, I'm really looking forward to chatting to you today. So I think just as a bit of background for our listeners, could you maybe give a brief overview of your background, some of the organisations you've worked with, and I guess what you're trying to achieve in your current roles at the moment? Yeah, well... I start in in the industry. Actually, I work um, in private sector for over more than 20 years, um, and I start to do research within private institution and collaborate with academic institution. But were mainly collaborations. And I start as a coach and as a, a technician. So I tested athletes, I prepare athletes. So I, I was a practitioner, and at one point, almost. Um, uh, it, it wasn't something uh, that I really wanted to do on purpose, but basically I, I had to train some athletes. Uh, at that time, I was uh, already quite um, interested in research. I was reading a lot of papers to understand how to train my athletes. And there were, in one area, mountain biking, there were not a lot of studies. So I, I started to develop this study with the help of people that were collaborating with our research center. And that's the way... I entered in research, and after that, uh, after 10 years uh, doing that kind of job, I moved in orthopedics uh, in, the, in Switzerland, where I start working initially in a neuromuscular lab, and after I move on Clinimatrix, uh, which is an area that is specialized on the validation of clinical measures, uh, uh, and especially the so-called questionnaires, so the patient reported outcome measures. And that was actually a very nice experience. In general, it was a nice experience because I changed completely topic area. So I could, uh, I, I was exposed to another culture, another environment, other kind of conferences. Uh, and I think uh, I miss actually sport. It was a nice experience, but that a bit changed my my career, I would say, because uh, it changed the way I see things. So, yeah, and and uh, five years ago, I relocated here. I came back in sports science uh, here in Australia, and I'm really happy to be here also because I can work with uh, very good and old friends, which was one of the, uh, 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 the things that uh, convinced me to relocate in, uh, uh, the other side of the world. And uh, the, the recruit, my recruitment was actually to try to improve uh, the quality of, uh, of research uh, so, uh, and methodological contribution. So this is a bit my what I'm trying to do in, in the last uh, five years. Uh, and, and that for me, it's, it's very good because it, uh, it fits my attitude. Uh, um, as uh, as um, yeah, I always say, I, I was one of the uh, first uh, members of the uh, Skeptic Society, so I'm very proud of that. I was very young, actually. Yeah, so that's a bit uh, in brief my <laughs> my story. Thank you. And yeah, that I think that experience of validating clinical measures is something that really shows with the work you're doing now, trying to advance the field of sports science and trying to, I think, bring a bit more methodological rigor to some of the things that are done in sports science and maybe where we can learn from other disciplines, which I think we'll come on to later in the discussion. But to start with, because a lot of your work and some of the things we'll talk about are in this concept of how we monitor and prescribe training load for athletes. Could you just describe 
in simple terms, what is training load? Yeah, well, uh, the the, the easy, easiest way to describe training load is just the amount of physical training. So what is done uh, or experienced by the athletes. And uh, even if it's an easy definition, it's actually the right definition because the term load uh, basically indicates an amount. And as we have written in a recent paper, the fact that load is used not only for training, but in, in other disciplines like uh, cognitive load or this kind of um, uh, combinations uh, is because load uh, also uh, convey the the idea of uh, of demand or something stressing the organism or or any system. So yeah, uh, the amount of uh, of physical training is the the best way to conceptualize uh, the training load. Okay, just to go into a bit more detail and clarify that then. Yeah. This is my own bias coming through, but as a biomechanist. I see the word load, or when I first got into this area of research, I saw the word load and my mind immediately jumps to forces measured in newtons and everything I'd been taught in class about what load means. Yeah. That's not what you're talking about here. So yeah. where is the difference? And because I know this has been a bit controversial recently, kind of why why is it OK to call it load when you're not referring to forces? Yeah, that's uh, the fact that you were thinking about the biomechanical meaning of load is uh, is your bias. <laughs> so yeah, the people dealing with uh, this kind of uh, with the mechanical uh, uh, definitions tend to interpret any terms biomechanically. So for me, there's uh, I mean there, I, there was this discussion, but. I struggled a bit at the beginning because I was not even thinking that that was a discussion. I mean, terms can be used in different areas, even within the same scientific area with different meanings. And this is absolutely normal. I can mention examples in in any field. Uh, Even the use of uh, stress and strain can be stress, for example, can be interpreted mechanically, can be interpreted psychologically. So I don't really think is a is a is an important debate. The, the, the important thing is to understand when we we refer to a specific meaning, it's better to define exactly to what we are referring for. There's no way, I mean, that uh, as, as we have written, that biomechanics or mechanics uh, should uh, have the priority over the other areas. So, but anyway, in the last paper, we also offer another option. So if you want to call those or exposure training, exposure training those, do it. It's uh, it's honestly, I, I don't see a problem. And I don't also think that if you say training load to a coach, and that's my experience as a practitioner, so, so anyone will think about the mechanical definition. Uh, it, it's like to say uh, the mental load and people questioning, oh, but what, what's the weight that you have on my mind? I mean, it's, uh, the context is clear. So it's not even a, a question of saying, but in science we have to be accurate. Yeah, that's true. That's why you have to define uh, to, to what you're referring to. But there's no accepted one unique definition of load. So that's uh, my easy answer. Yeah, I think your two key points there were the one around context and the one around defining it. Make sure everybody knows what you're talking about. Make sure the context is there. I think. The only place is a bit more of a grey area is where we are talking about maybe a bit more mechanical load on the body and, you know, but also referring to training load. But as you say, define it, give it context and yeah. hopefully yeah. all should be OK. Talking of demands on the body, that sounds like quite a difficult concept or something that could be measured in hundreds or thousands of different ways. So is there one type of training load or are there different things that we can be talking about here? Now, training load should be interpreted as, as a concept. It's like if I tell you um, I'm training strength, um, okay, or can you measure if I'm stronger? Uh, how do you measure if I'm stronger with a 1RM uh, or isometric, uh, what instrument, what device? I mean, there is a concept that we have in our mind when we refer to strength, but there's a, it's a, it is an, an abstraction, is a, is a concept, is a construct. And the same is for training load. The training load, as I said, is the amount of physical training. What is physical training? What people do uh, with intention uh, 
for example, to improve their physical capacity of health. So these are ab absolutely generic uh, concepts, indeed are core concepts for, for the same reason. So uh, there's no one measure of training load. It depends what aspects and what uh, uh, elements of training load you are interested. There is uh, uh, some discussion about the use of single measures for training load. You don't need to use a single measure. That's the point. <laughs> the, when I, I, I collaborate with coaches, because I work mainly with coaches, which is uh, uh, curious and not with sports science departments. But when I work with coaches, uh, uh, they often ask, what measure, what metric uh, do I use? Uh, I said, well, it depends. It depends what you're training, what are the goal of your training. Based on the goal, we can select the right measure reflecting the potential mechanisms. And we use more than one measure. I mean, you can measure high speed running, but this uh, is just a portion of the, of the information. You can measure uh, heart rate. So you don't need to use one measure. There is no written anywhere that we need to use one measure. And we can also create models with more variables. So why do we need to combine everything in a single number? Yeah. And how does that tie in with the concept of internal or external load? Yeah, the concept of, of external, which is actually interesting because the, the, when we proposed this classification was for a paper targeting more practitioners, not for researchers. And we wanted to define, uh, let's say, components of the training process that can be measured. And uh, we di differentiate the internal from the external load, which is actually an adaptation of some concepts that were around uh, in, in the coaching world. Uh, we differentiate because we wanted to separate uh, what you, you prescribe and what you see uh, others doing, sprinting, jumping, or this kind of activities, uh, from uh, the physiological responses that these activities uh, are generating within the body. Because the point at that time, and even now actually, is that sometimes we focus on what we see. So we see someone sprinting and jumping or running 20 kilometers per hour, and we forget that the what is generating a physiological adaptation is, is the internal response. So how the physiological system are uh, involve uh, the level of activation of the muscles, all these kind of things. And we we all know that if we have people uh, completing exactly the same uh, uh, work uh, and they have different uh, uh, different fitness level, these induce different adaptations. Uh, if you uh, you have two players running at 20 kilometers per hour, and you measure the no activation, whatever you can measure in a reliable way, you would see that the responses uh, to the same, uh, uh, what we call external load are different. So the idea was to separate these two components and uh, to remind people that when you write down on a piece of paper, the training program, you should think uh, what uh, what the, the, the exercise or, or, or the combination that you have written this piece of papers will generate within the body. So that's that's that was actually the reason why we started to differentiate. And over years, of course, it was 20 years, uh, I, we conceptualized a bit more and we tried to understand the uh, comparison with, uh, with epidemiology and pharmacology. It's just uh, a way to understand whether this concept uh, makes sense and the fact that the similar concept is used in other areas for us is a sort of uh, internal uh, validation of the concept. Yeah, and I think, again, we'll come back to that later on, but the fact that relationship between different factors or that causal pathway of A causes B, which causes C, which causes D, which is our performance outcome or our injury likelihood or whatever it is we're interested in, I think is something that you're doing a great job of bringing into these discussions in sports science. But just again, to give a bit more of an maybe practical examples that people can sink their teeth into a bit more. How is this currently being applied in elite sports settings? What are people measuring? And then when they do measure it, what decisions are those data actually being used to inform? 
Well, the, nowadays we tend to use much more external, uh, measure of external load, GPS, uh, power meters, uh, and this is because, uh, because it's easier and also because, uh, and, and I, I, I don't think I'm saying something uh, controversial because there is also more commercial interest in that area. So you have companies pro- promoting and they are doing their job. So I, I understand there's nothing bad in that actually. Um, the fact that maybe they they sell their products or their metrics or their major as a instrument that can help to optimize performance, reduce the injury, uh, reduce the illnesses and that all preparing coffees and whatever, it's of course an exaggeration. But uh, some people ask me what I think about these approaches, which are very aggressive commercially. I think they are do- just doing their job. Uh, if people buy everything, it's their fault at the end. So if you if you don't understand that sometimes things seem to be too good to be true, that's your problem. I don't feel very empathetic with these uh, uh, with those that buy everything. Yeah, so I think that there's more uh, more interest and it's more common to use external measure. The funny thing is that most of the time the internal measure, the external measure, are uh, used to um, uh, to try to understand the internal responses. And I, I, I just give you this example is an anecdote. Um, a, a friend of mine with whom I was working at one point asked me to understand what measures uh, uh, derived from the GPS could be used to understand the cardiovascular load, let's say. And I said, why Why are you asking that? Yeah, because when they complete these kind of uh, drills, uh, these parameters uh, uh, from the GPS are similar, but I see that the one is more demanding than the others, and I don't see this in the numbers. And they say, how, how do you know? This is well because uh, they, I asked them and they confirmed that they were perceiving more effort and and they said I also once I also used the art rate and I have seen that actually the art rate is higher so I said well in my opinion you you already provide me the answer you can use the perceived exertion or you just add the art rate I, I'm giving you this example because sometimes. Uh, we we are a bit lost in all these uh, uh, devices, numbers, and, and we stop thinking. And when I said that, uh, yeah, my friend told me, yeah, that, that's actually right. <laughs> yeah, I said, I, I feel a bit stupid. I said, no, no, I mean, it's okay. But from that day, we just start to use the heart rate monitor as a standard measure. And, of course, the heart rate does uh, only reflect an aspect which, uh, but that was the aspect that he was interested to, so it's okay. So that this is just to say that we focus more on external measure, but we can rely a bit more also on internal measure. With what we have, there are some probably technological limitations at the moment. There are uh, people who are trying to develop new technologies, and, and they will see. Yeah, and that's, I think something in academic research we make that mistake a lot as well similar to what you've just described where people have these fancy tools and fancy techniques and it almost turns into what can i measure what can i do oh here's a load of interesting numbers whereas the better approach at least in my opinion and it sounds like what you're also saying is to work backwards from that intended application or objective whereas you've said it's what do you want to know the cardiovascular demands on this athlete So then you say, what's the best way of measuring that cardiovascular demand? And you come up with a different answer to just starting with your new GPS device and saying, oh, what can I measure with it? And I think that's something else that comes through quite strongly in your recent paper that you were talking about, how validity is context specific or something is valid for a specific purpose. So, again, a bit of a silly example, but a heart rate monitor, as you mentioned, can be valid for measuring heart rate but it's not going to be valid for measuring jump height. And it's that same thing, actually, what do you want to measure with that thing? And is it valid for that purpose? Um, But anyway, kind of following on this discussion of what are people measuring, kind of how are they applying it? 
when people are taking these measures of training load, whether it be internal or external, GPS, heart rate, whatever, are they using those to design training practice or are they simply monitoring the training they're already designing or would people ever you know would people be substituted from a match because of their training load metrics or would a coach ever be altering their training practice in the middle of a session because of what their laptop or ipad is telling them about somebody's training load yeah i mean it, it depends first of all to what practitioner we are referring to if he's a coach, is a sports scientist, or in what context in rehabilitation or training for performance, or it, it really depends on the context. Um, what I can tell you is more my experience, uh, because I don't know uh, what the practitioners or the practitioners uh, uh, do with the, with this data. Um, I tell you my experience, and I tell you how I work with uh, with the teams. Uh, I usually, uh, when I start to discuss with them, I usually say, forget about the measures at the moment. Just let's uh, sit and discuss about the training. What do you want to do and why? And this is for me the main question, because from that question, and I can understand what measure they would need and what measure we have at disposal among those that have some uh, evidence of validity. Um, to, to support the training process. Um, as you mentioned, I see sometimes a bit different, a bit different approach. People thinking that the numbers can tell you how and what to train. And in my opinion, this is not possible at the moment. I don't think it's even conceptually logical to approach the problem in this way. Um, I, 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 I prefer, uh, let's say, a bottom-up approach. Let's understand what information we need, and after we use, uh, we understand how to have uh, to get this information. I don't see often this this approach because until now, I would say 100% of all my experiences with uh, collaborating with teams, they don't. Uh, they it's like if they forgot a bit the the relevance and the importance of a good training plan. And they, 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 are, they want benchmarks. And bench, I understand why they want benchmarks. And I think it's mainly for two reasons. One is because uh, it seems a way to uh, eliminate our uncertainty and our doubts. So you say, okay, how much training I have to do? Two, three times the load of the game, these kind of things. Uh, and they check the data. They say, oh, we are very close to two. They feel better and they say, okay, I did what I needed to do. So it's more psychological. And, um, and, and, and the other, especially in professional sports, sometimes it's just to protect their back. And, and I can tell you, we use uh, in some situations uh, these numbers to protect our back when people said, oh, you, the team is not uh, running enough during the game and uh, there's some problem with the physical condition. So we show that the performance was physical performance was constant all over the season. So you said, no, it doesn't look like that. I, I have to be honest, when I said that, I was thinking that I was cheating because they, they, they never change. I mean, the mean, the, the average of, of the activity over a season is always very similar. So you can always say that basically. Um, so I, I was thinking I was using my skills to cheat. Eh? But yeah, actually in that situation, the, the, the information were, were useful. So I think the, the coach, the, well, I think some coaches don't, don't, don't care at all about these measures. Um, I can't tell you the name of the team, but they're very famous NFL team. Um, the coach of a famous NFL team, uh, they have a very strong and big uh, sports science department providing all the dashboard. And the coach told me, yeah, I don't, I don't give a I don't even look at those. Uh, I say, oh, yes, thank you very much. So we, we would need to understand how these data are actually used. Of course, every situation is different. I'm not saying that they, they are not used. I cannot generalize my experience, but I think that this is an area where we should be uh, discuss a bit more in front of a beer among sports scientists, probably more often. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm reminded there, especially when you're talking about distance covered or um, during a match, uh, I think it's Goodhart's law, but that idea that 
um, what is it? Once a measure becomes a target, it ceases to become a good measure. And that idea of, you know, even if distance covered did correlate with match outcome, the moment you give targets for distance covered and people are just running around a pitch for no reason, that's not conducive to winning a match or various stories. in I think footballers autobiographies and things like that of, you know, sprint, sprinting flat out to take a throw in or for a corner kick or something just to get their numbers up um, or various things people do when these, when these numbers suddenly become a target that their performance is judged by. And actually, like you said earlier, you're losing that working backwards from what is it you're actually trying to achieve and judge people on that first yeah, and foremost. Yeah, that's, that's uh, the good, the hard, the low, you know. <laughs> but this might be maybe the more interesting part of the podcast, but what do you see as some of the current limitations? You've mentioned a few, but with the way the majority of people are currently applying training load monitoring, are there any big limitations that you see or any big myths that you think myths or misconceptions that you think you can maybe put to bed? Yeah. From a coach perspective or from a researcher perspective? Either or both. Uh, OK. Well, uh, that for, from a coach perspective, I think I already mentioned in part uh, what are the problems. They they are they rely too much on these numbers. Most of the time they don't really understand what these numbers are. We, we are planning some studies to uh, for example, to, to, to see or to show how practitioners uh, interpret the various metrics uh, because we have the strong feeling that they interpret based on the name these metrics uh, have. So if I tell you, for example, metabolic power, people associate this to something physiological, metabolic training, this kind of things. If I use uh, um, other terminology, you know, some companies using uh, what was a eccentric uh, index, something like that. Of course, you think that this, this uh, matrix will reflect the eccentric uh, contribution uh, to the activity, the things like that. In reality, what we we know is that most of these name labels are just labels. They are not uh, validated, meaning they haven't shown that this actually reflect uh, some specific uh, uh, mechanism or that these reflect more than other matrix with another name specific mechanism. So from a coach perspective and, and some practitioner perspective, I think they, they, it's not easy to navigate uh, uh, around the, all this mess because I think it's a bit of a mess. From a research perspective, uh, I think, uh, how can I say that politely? I think that we are a bit victims of uh, a publish and perish culture. So it's more, it's, it's not rare to see papers where you can easily understand that the main goal was to have a publication more and not really to answer a precise research question. And, and uh, so I think that in terms of research, we need to improve uh, methodologically for sure in what we do and we need to spend more time understanding the concepts that we are introducing in our study. I I, I mean most of the time uh, uh, most of these studies are just a combination of correlations that uh, are interpreted post hoc and ad hoc uh, which means these kind of studies are very open uh, very prone to bias, and so you you build your nice explanation that makes sense, and you try to publish the paper. Uh, that's that's I think what has caused our area to 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 go down, because this is I mean it's not a mystery that I, I am very critical to to sports to the sports science here in terms of research. So that's that's a bit. Uh, my, my perspective on this uh, on this topic. What would you like to see then? So building on some of those limitations of current research, what should future studies do differently? Or, you know, if I were to start a study this afternoon, you know, with, I guess the world's quickest ethics approval. But if I were to start a study this afternoon and, you know, I wanted to look at something to do with heart, um, training load monitoring in elite football, say, what do you think are the big future studies that can be done that would, going back to what we said about working backwards, studies that would actually have a big impact on applied 
practitioners rather than just being researched for the yeah. sake of it. I think that this is actually the message that we wanted to deliver with our last paper. I think we really need to understand what the different measure and matrix reflect in terms of uh, physiological uh, um, underpinning and let's say mechanisms. Because to understand how to use these numbers, I need to understand what these numbers really reflect. So this is, I think, where we, we should focus more than inventing a new matrix every week. Uh, um, because I find quite um, ironic to use, for example, PCA to reduce the dimension when uh, uh, to reduce uh, yeah the, the dimension when the, uh, the myriad of variables have been created mostly by sports scientists. So instead of inventing a new metric every now and then, maybe it's better to slow down and just select uh, uh, understanding. Among the metric and measure, we have the one that are really valid. What they, what is the information they provide? That's the way that can allow us to use this information for real, and not just to make uh, dashboards. I mean, in the end, uh, our job is to help coaches, unless we are coaches uh, ourselves. But normally, is to help coaches or helping any professional that need to train someone for some uh, uh, to obtain normally benefits. Uh, and so to understand what to do and how to do it, we need to understand uh, using monitoring systems, uh, what uh, mechanism we are challenging, uh, to what extent uh, we are challenging them in order to optimize the training. So this is where I would invest uh, as a funder, uh, I would invest my, my money. I would say, okay, now, Let's stop a bit uh, to develop a new number, some strange, uh, with strange names. Uh, let's uh, stop that. We come back uh, and now we take one by one and we try to understand if these are valid, how they can be used and how is, um, uh, and what mechanism they reflect. Because, you know, I, I, I did also in the past. When you write a paper and the end you say, oh, this information can be useful to optimize training. As a coach, I always wonder how. So now that I know this information, what I do? Tomorrow, uh, I get on the pitch and what do I change compared to what I was doing before? And I have to say that most of the time I have no idea. I probably, you cannot change anything you were doing before. And it's a very generic statement. I start uh, to hate. The reason why I wrote also in the past is because sometimes the reviewers want, want something like that, or the journal asks you for practical application, which is something I, I hate, because not all the studies can provide practical applications, and not all uh, studies must provide practical applications. You are right to practical application after building up a, a, a body of knowledge, which is based not only on applied research, but sometimes also basic research. So there are different steps before arriving and implementing something. There's not such a thing like a single study that can tell us how to improve the training program. It's like to have a single study telling you what pill or what drug to use to cure something. It doesn't work like that. It's a process. You need to work a lot uh, independent groups, for example, replicating the results. Uh, um, I tell you just this, uh, which is a bit OT, but when I published my first papers, uh, I never I never trusted my data. I always wonder, what about if I was wrong? Maybe was uh, I measure in the wrong way? Maybe I biased the process. Uh, so... I never really trusted my results until I could see similar results replicated by others. And I remember that when I, I, I read papers by other groups, I went to my colleagues happy and said, oh, look, they, they found the same. So maybe we, we were going the right track in the right direction. And, and, and this is something we should remember as, as a scientist, not to, to, to give too much credit to what we do. I mean, we may make mistakes and, 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 and you never, and you don't know. So we need the replication. We need other people uh, challenging and trying to replicate the same, uh, the same studies or the same um, uh, concepts. 
And you mentioned there about, you know, in one of your examples about drugs and pills and research that goes into launching a new medicine. So maybe that's a good time to bring in some of your experience from maybe a more clinical background or setting. Some of the terms you've mentioned really early on was around how, you know, internal and external training load could be um, associated with concepts such as exposure and dose um, of medicine. And you've also you know, we've spoken about causal frameworks and things like that. How would this type of research be done in other fields? And maybe what can we learn from that? Well, as I told you, uh, when I change uh, area, change my perspective, because I could see things from far. Um, because when you are you, you grow up in, a, in an environment, in a context uh, uh, you think that only knowledge is within your context. You don't you don't look outside. And when I change uh, basically change job, I had to do that. I had to read other kind of literature, and uh, and I, it's the first time that I start to read more epidemiological oriented literature. And every time I read this, I was thinking, wow, they they had the same problem we have now. But they solve it <laughs> ten years ago. Basically, they, I mean, they solve it. They propose solutions, uh, a lot of solutions. They implemented already these uh, solutions. Uh, so I realized that we were reinventing the wheel. And I, 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 I really think that there are, if there are any, there are very few things that other areas haven't already addressed in, in some ways. So it, I think it's smarter from, from our perspective to take advantage of what other areas have done. And uh, one of the, the, the disappointing things I, I, I heard and I, I'm hearing still now from colleagues, uh, or by colleagues I mean sports scientists, is uh, that uh, sports science for some reasons is m- more difficult to study than medicine, drugs, these kind of things, which is uh, for me that I work in that area, uh, almost uh, unbelievable, because I don't really understand if we are so arrogant to think that we are the, so smart that we, we are dealing with an area which is the most difficult in the world. I have friends that are working in genetic, uh, in genetic environment, um, climate change, pollution, these kind of things. And I see how complex are their models, their, 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 their work is really complicated. And I see the same challenges we have. So I think that we can learn a lot from other areas. Um, if we have to write something about uh, decision making, there are tons of area of scientific areas in which decision making has been investigated, including medicine and clean in the, in the clinical context. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that we need our, we must rely on the uh, knowledge accumulating in other areas. And we are in sports science. This is actually the justification I provide to explain why we are struggling a lot, especially now. Now, I say now because now there are more advancements in terms of technology. By technology, I mean social analysis, uh, these kind of things. We are really a multidisciplinary area. So we cover everything. We cover biomechanics, so let's say physics, uh, um, uh, nutrition, uh, psychology, behaviors, uh, all these kind of things. So it's, um, it's a very unlikely that we may, may be expert of everything as a discipline. What I see that we we don't have, and that's not easy, is more collaboration with experts of the sub-disciplines in which we work. And I think as a, as a biomechanist, you know uh, what I'm uh, uh, what I'm saying. Um, you may be good in mathematics, uh, but there are problems for which you need a knowledge of mathematics that is very advanced. And you need someone with a, a degree in mathematics, physics, or these other areas. And uh, you cannot have all the expertise 
in, 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 your, in your brain, uh, but you can have a very good perspective of the problem. So you can have contextual uh, knowledge. You have the basics to be able to interact with these experts. So what I think we need uh, to improve, for example, is to collaborate more with the other disciplines. We cannot pretend to read a couple of papers or one book and be ready because we are not. We need ears. Uh, you, you know, we discussed that I'm, I'm studying epidemiology. It's years now, and I feel ready to to chat with epidemiologists more than running uh, studies independently. Even causal inference, uh, you know, we, I refer a lot of causal inference, and I study for years. I read a lot about causal inference, and I was I was thinking to be ready. So I would say, okay, now I can start the first studies. Uh, until I, I didn't uh, uh, meet uh, Ian Schreier, who is really in, in sport medicine uh, uh, the, the best uh, researcher in that area and with an incredible expertise. And I realized I didn't know it. So, wow, <laughs> I'm not ready at all. There are a lot of problems that I couldn't see. There are a lot of problems I have no idea how to solve. And so I benefit from uh, the collaboration with Ian. I benefit. I don't know if he benefits something from from me, but for me it was very productive. It was very good. So the the idea of cause and inference is very interesting, especially because for cause and inference you need to to make explicit your assumptions. So I know exactly what you have in your mind. Maybe I don't agree, but I know exactly how the data were analyzed and what kind of structure you uh, you wanted to to confirm it with the data. And if I don't agree, it doesn't matter if I don't agree, but I know that uh, uh, why you, you run some analysis and why you interpret some results in a specific way. If I don't agree with your uh, causal structure, I will be not interested in the results, uh, but it's okay. I mean, we cannot all agree uh, eventually, we run another study, which I explain why I don't agree. I test another model, but in this way, we can build, uh, we can grow up as a, as a community and uh, as, a, as a scientists, uh, not uh, running random correlations and interpreting in a way that uh, allow us to write a nice story in the paper. Yeah, thank you. And I think as well as all of that around how we communicate with you know, experts in other disciplines. Something else you've mentioned quite a bit is communicating or communication between researchers and practitioners. Do you have any advice or recommendations around for either side, how we can improve that dialogue and help help to align the academic and practice world within sports science? Yeah, to, I answer this uh giving you my a broader perspective about the role of sports scientists in, in, in sport. I think that uh, we went on the wrong track, meaning that at some point the sports scientist was the one downloading the, the GPS and providing dashboard, these kind of things. And as I told you, we don't have the, the education on average. Of course, there are uh, people that are absolutely outstanding. Some I know some, and they are absolutely outstanding, but they are outliers. They are not the the average. Yeah. So we have to think about the average education. And I don't think we we have the preparation, the education to deal with some kind of data nowadays that the technology is improving, and and I don't think is even our job actually to do that. What I think we should do is to be this. Uh, uh, trade union, that is a connection between the field and uh, the different uh, disciplines that can contribute uh, to understand the process, the training and the sport in general process. So uh, that's the area where I think we can give our contribution and where we are we are the best. Because we are not expert in any, we know a bit of everything, which uh, uh, is the characteristic and the kind of, of knowledge that can allow us to understand when we have a problem, what is the, the expert that we, we have, on which we have to, re, on uh, whom we have to rely for having the answers we need. So this is a bit like 
uh, how I see our our job as a sports scientist. So I agree, we need this connection, and that connection actually is the sports science work. So sports scientists should be able to translate the the requests and the the, the questions from the field to those that just mainly focus on research, and we have to do the other way around. Once there is an answer, we have to make this answer understandable. And when the researchers develop something, this something should be workable. And it should be something that can be implemented. Given everything that you've said over the last however many minutes, where do you see training load monitoring in the next five years or the next 10 years? I think it's, it is going to get worse before it gets better. Because uh, now we struggle to deal with all the information that the technologies can provide us. Well, we cannot even recognize the real information from noise uh, because a lot of uh, companies uh, uh, fight with each other using new matrix, uh, inventing new things. Now we have artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, and again, in clinical setting, these technologies arrive earlier. They they already they already addressing the problems, how to improve uh, things and and so on. So I I I don't know. I have no idea how to predict the future. I think at the moment I see too too many information, and we I see people struggling in dealing with this information. And the only way, and the way that is becoming prevalent is to create, uh, to simplify the problem, to satisfy our psychological distress more than a, a, scientific, uh, a scientific question, let's say. So I think that in the next few years, uh, things will, will be worse. But as every uh, as any phenomenon, I think that that situation at one point will implode, but will create uh, and will generate a, a new wave of also sports scientists that will fix that problem. So I think that in ten years uh, 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 the situation may be better. I, I I bet my money on on the new generation. I have seen more interest in the new generations on uh, good science, meta research, all these kind of things uh, than my generation. Uh, it seems more that my generation, we want just to keep our status quo, while people that have to create this status quo, they are more prone to to change, to improve. Yeah, I, I, maybe what I just said <laughs> will not make me popular, popular, but uh, yeah, I don't care <laughs> to be popular, so yeah. Oh, well, I appreciate the honesty. For members of that new generation or anybody really listening, anyone that does want to get on board with that new wave that you speak about, what would be your advice or anywhere people can go really to find out more about your work or more about other work in this area that you think will lead them towards this kind of better approach in the future? Well, the uh, first I, I tell you what what is my suggestion to the new generation and also to my students, for example. First of all, remember that you have to study now and the rest of your life. Um, the moment you stop reading methodological papers, books, this is where or you are moving in a, your career in another direction, I say more administrative uh, uh, as a manager, or you will go down uh, in terms of knowledge. The, the, there are so many things coming out now in the in the world of science, and you have to keep a bit up with these uh, with these new technologies, new things. So you need to study uh, always. That's uh, so education is the key. Uh, the, the other suggestion always in this area is to to be patient. Uh, this is. Also, personally, in the past, it was difficult, but uh, I learned to be patient. So sometimes you have to say, OK, this is an area I'm interested in. I want you to know more. I need one, two, three years, maybe. 
before I can write something on that. I, I Sometimes I speak with people, I mention an area, and after a few months I see they try to write an article about that area. I say, wow, I mean, it's here, so I'm trying, or is a genius, or maybe is is um, uh, is trying to address a topic uh, that they think they understand, but in reality it's much more complex. This, for example, is for causal inference. Um, when you read uh, the introduction to causal inference, you explain causal inference is quite... Uh, it seems easy, actually, because it's very graphical, all these kind of things. Reality is absolutely complicated. When you start to read papers, uh, more advanced papers, uh, you realize that. And and so you need a lot of time. And I, I think it's an area that can be, from which we can benefit a lot, but we need a lot of time. So we need to study. We need to read. We need to collaborate with experts. And we need to try to learn from experts. That That's... Um, the, what what is recommend my suggestion recommendation to the new generation the, the first thing is uh, is uh, uh, learn to use google well um, the point is that when you have a topic don't look at that topic in sports science look in all the areas if you are you want to write something about decision making, look at decision making used in economics and management. If you want to understand causal inference, look how causal inference is addressed in, in medicine and psychology, in in, in in other areas. And normally, I don't rely on literature in our area almost at all. Uh, to avoid the bias uh, that can be generated by our area. And and uh, so I, I tend to read the books uh, from completely different areas. It can be industry or the only area where more similar to, to us is biology. So some text in, in biology or some models uh, uh, in, in biology. But this is uh, where I, I tend to find the information looking in, in other area. First, not after first. This is my personal, uh, what, what I do. I mean, I'm not saying that this is the right way, but this is what I try to do. And okay, for my, my papers are all published. So you can find what we have written in, uh, in PubMed easily. Um, we tend when we can to, to publish preprints. That's another area that I'm very interested in, meta science, open science. We have objective difficulties in our area, but um, I'm trying to, to address with a post talk with uh, John Barehoven, uh, who is a, a young and great researcher, is helping to develop this area of open science and meta research. Yeah. Thanks, Franco. Yeah. Thank you for your honesty, insights, advice, <laughs> and I think thank you for all of the, your efforts to advance the discipline and not just kind of maintain that status quo, as you said, but actually bring your learnings from other disciplines into our own to hopefully benefit not just training load monitoring, but, you know, sports science in general. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. And thank, thank you. you for coming on the thank podcast. Thank you very much, Stuart. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Experts in Sport podcast. If you'd like to get in touch, then please contact me, Martin Foster, at m.foster at alborough.ac.uk. Thanks for listening. See you next time.